thank you, Rabbi Markman. What a wonderful introduction. Uh, it is not uh, Angie Treblinka, which would be a terrible, terrible comedy. Um, it's, uh, it was called Angie Tribeca. Angie, <laughs> Angie Treblinka was a very short-lived show in Germany that was <laughs> terrible. Poland, that's right. Sorry, I was just, actually, I was just there last year. You know what? Thank you very much, geographer. Yes. Treblinka was in Poland. Okay, any other questions about uh, Holocaust comedies? Um, <laughs> All right, it is, it, is wonderful. it is wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to be at Maury's Fireplace. I've had uh, a lot of uh, great events here. Both my kids had their, uh, my daughter had her bat mitzvah dinner here, and my, not as fancy as this, of course. Um, and my son had his bar mitzvah dinner here, but most famously, uh, I had my uh, 50th surprise birthday here. Um, not my 50th surprise birthday. It was my 50th birthday, and, and it was... Uh, it was a surprise. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever had a, uh, a surprise party. I don't know if you've ever had a surprise party, but it's, it's, it's very, very surreal. Um, you come in, I remember we threw one for my dad for his 65th birthday, and he was walking around a, a haze, and I said, what, what's going on? You're not like really like interacting. And then my dad, I'll tell you about my dad in a little bit. It's not so odd that he's not interacting. It, it's odd that he's not insulting anybody. So. <laughs> I'm like, what's, what's the matter? Why you not he said, I thought I died. Because you really do. You like really, it's such a shock to your system. So I come in through that door over there. And the, the ruse was that I was going to speak to another group. I, um, the, um, I was the chairman of the board of Maimonides Academy where my, where my kids went. And I just actually came from a board meeting there. They think I'm in the bathroom there. And then I went to a shear on Shabbos. They think I'm in the bathroom there. So uh, I'm going to have to see a doctor after this. But uh, <laughs> so uh, I came into that door. And I came in here. And it was very surreal because I thought I was going to a speaking event. And the speaking event, and I decided for the first time in my life that I was not going to prepare. This is the second time in my life. I <laughs> you guys are getting what you pay for tonight. T trust me. <laughs> And um, so I came in that door, and then all of a sudden I saw on, on a court, I remember, um, actually, Rabbi Yellen. You know Rabbi Yellen. So I saw Rabbi Yellen over there next to the flare tender. I had flare tenders. It's fantastic, like bartenders that charge a lot. And, um, and then I saw my writing partner. And it was like, and then I saw like some, some, some actors I worked with. And then I saw some guys from Shul. And then I saw my family. I thought, like, I definitely died, but there's celebrities here and rabbis, so I don't know if I'm Gehenna or, you know, in Shemayim. Um, wouldn't it be great if I could work that story into this whole thing? Because I just thought of that today, and I just thought um, another thing. Um, the greatest thing I've ever heard, seen somebody work into, I saw a, it was another Jewish organization that had a comedian. Obviously, um, they paid for this, so it's not me. You guys are getting it for free, so it's not going to be that good. <laughs> but he did this close-up magic, and I, remember, I wish I remembered his name because it was really incredible. Afterwards, he came up to me, and I was like, wow, that was really good. I actually came up to him. I came up to him, and I said, that was such a great, um, that was such a great act. Can I have your card? And he goes, oh, I don't have a card. And I said, if you were a great magician, you would just go, of course. I don't have a card, but here. And he said, no, if I was a great magician you would go home tonight and there would be a card under your pillow. <laughs> and I said, you know what, that's exactly right. That's, you would be a great magician. Anyway, we laughed. I went home and I was like, I'm sitting downstairs, I'm like, I gotta check. I, <laughs> I gotta check. This guy said he was a great magician. By the way, he was a great magician. And, and, and I go under my pillow, and my wife's name is Shawnee, and then you just hear 30 seconds later from downstairs, Shawnee! <laughs> And I come downstairs with his card. <laughs> and it was under my pillow. And it was the most, yeah, it was the most incredible thing. So I call the guy, because now I have his number. <laughs> and I'm like, that's the most incredible thing I've ever seen. Like, you, you really are, you did, that's magic. Like, there's no way that he, I came home, and there's no way there. And he said, yeah, you know, you, you have to have one trick in your book that's like, I was like, you have to do it. He, How do you do it? He says, it's magic. And I asked my wife, and I begged my wife, and I was like, this is unbelievable. Like, my life changed. <laughs> I believed in magic. And so much so that 
then my wife told me, I told her, I said, like, really this happened? And it was really, it was really, I remember telling my kids that there was no tooth fairy. You could still hear the screaming. <laughs> there were 17. And, but I believed in magic. And then she told me how it happened. And I realized there's no such thing as magic. <laughs> and that people really don't want to know the truth. Well, I'm going to tell you something. There's a little something magic. There's a magic in, in being a Jew, and I'm going to tell you the truth about it. I'm, so I'm going to tell you how I started. I did not grow up. Uh, I did not grow up uh, religious. I was, uh, I was brought up reform. It actually was not until I grew up in, in Long Island, and it was not until moving to LA that I had a rabbi who didn't wear a dress. Um, I only had male rabbis, but I, um, it was not until L.A. Uh, when, when I had actually, I, I went and I, I met an Orthodox rabbi. I was grown to, I grew up to, to fear the Orthodox like every good reform Jew. Um, and like every good reformed Jew, I had Friday night dinner at the Delta Diner, uh, Cheeseburger Deluxe. Um, so how did I go to having my kosher party here at Maury's Fireplace? Uh, how did I grow up as this... Reformed Jew who on Passover, we had light beer. Um, to uh, partying with rabbis and celebrities. So maybe that's how we'll tie it in, is like to talk about my life, which is, is uh, you know, it, a lot of people ask how I do it. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you how I do it and what I do. And I will tell you, because I speak to a lot of groups about becoming a writer. And the, group, the, the story about becoming a writer and working in Hollywood if uh, I always tell people that, that I start with is if I have not convinced you not to do this job, then I have not done my job here tonight. <laughs> um, so uh, let's talk about where I started. I, I grew up on Long Island, and I went to the uh, Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. I got my Bachelor of Science in Economics. I was a finance major, so that's my background in comedy. Um, <laughs> And where's the, oh, it's two pages. All right, there we go. So when I grew up, I knew I wanted to do uh, one thing. I wanted to make money, because I didn't grow up with money, and I had an unhappy childhood. So I figured, you know, what's the, uh, what would make my life happier is if I, have, uh, if I had money. Um, so I thought, OK, I'll just make money. Um, the only problem was, and I, so I went to investment banking. The only problem was I was terrible at investment banking. But what I was good at doing was cracking jokes. So, uh, I used to do stand-up comedy. I actually, uh, I actually auditioned for Saturday Night Live the same time that the um, uh, Chris Rock auditioned. I know they went a different way. <laughs> By the way, it wasn't until this year where I thought he won, and now I was like, I've never been slapped by Will Smith. I think I, won. <laughs> I think I won. But I did, uh, I did stand up, and I uh, won a competition called The Funniest Man on Wall Street which I know is like being Jewish high jumper. It's not like amazing. <laughs> it's like four of us. Um, but, and I was supposed to be on a network called the Ha Network, which turned into Comedy Central uh, right before the story takes place. And uh, they said, we want you to come on TV. And now this is incredible. I was going to be on TV, at cable TV even. Um, and um, they said, OK, it's going to be on Tuesday. And then I, um, I looked at the schedule on Tuesday, and Tuesday was Yom Kippur. And I was like, ah, I can't do that on Yom Kippur because I'm going to be fasting. I'm not going to be funny. Even though right now I'm basically fasting except for wine. <laughs> um, and, um, but I also thought about my grandmother. And I thought, you know, my grandmother won't be able to see it. So I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it on Yom Kippur. Uh, the next, I, I said, I'll just reschedule. I said, I can't do it on Yom Kippur. Can we do another day? They said, sure, call us next week. Next week they were bought by Comedy Central which uh, decided that South Park was more important than the funniest man on Wall Street. So I never got the, um, I never got the job. I never got the gig uh, to be on there. And I, and I was kind of, uh, I was kind of upset. You know, I had a relationship with God. My relationship with God, I think, growing up was that, you know, you pray to God for things. And if they happen, that means you worked hard. And if they didn't happen, you just are lucky that you didn't get smote. Um, I think the, the God I grew up with was big on smoting you know, or smiting. And um, so, you know, I was kind of, I was kind of pissed. It's like, why didn't I get this? And I was like, that was the first time in my life, I think, that I ever, like, went out of limb. I'm like, I didn't do this on Yom Kippur because of, I guess, because of you, God, and this is how I get repaid. Um, so I had that in my pocket, and God owed me one, <laughs> and he paid me back. Uh, here I am. Um, 
So I decided um, after that that I was going to move to LA because I was going to become a sitcom writer. I was terrible at, at, um, at investment banking and um, you know, I, I, there was a rabbi I heard called Rabbi Orlowick who said, if you want to know what you should do with your life, it's what you're good at. So that's what I was good at. The only thing I was good at. My skill set is, is you're looking at one of the two things that I'm good at. This is right now I'm, I'm good at reading a speech that I wrote in 1995 and updating it <laughs> in real time. Um, and I'm good, at, I'm good at writing. Everything else is outside my, my wheelhouse and way outside my wheelhouse. It drops off. My wheelhouse is on top of a very, very tall cliff and then everything falls off. <laughs> Um, so I went and my parents were very supportive. My father says, if you go, you will be a complete failure and um, I will take you out of the family and I won't tell you when I die. Uh, I said, well, you're probably not going to tell me when you die anyway, so I'm going to do it. Um, <laughs> not, not supportive. So um, I showed up and I showed him by uh, taking the next year and I delivered sandwiches. Um, and I taught SATs. I drove a $100 car, which was the worst investment of my life. And I, uh, I ran $25,000 in credit card debt. But I did, um, you know, I knew I had in my mind, and people ask this. People ask, like, you know, what everybody asked me, all my supportive friends and family said, what are you going to do when you don't make it? This is the part where I'll go into the kind of entertainment part of my journey. Um, nothing up until this point has been entertaining. And... Um, so they said, what are you going to do if you don't make it? What are you going to do when you come back? Um, and I had no, there was no concept in my mind that I wasn't going to make it. There was no, it was impossible that I wasn't going to make it. Like, it just, it wasn't like, maybe it was arrogance. I was 25, 26 years old. Maybe that's just like, you know, some of you people, you're just stupid. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there's an arrogance. And you have to have that, right? You have to have chutzpah. You know, that's what we're Jews. We have chutzpah. And so, but I didn't, it didn't even cross my mind that I wouldn't make it. And even I knew that these were my poor days. And I really, um, I know I have a friend, uh, Rabbi David Aaron, who was uh, uh, Kirk Douglas's rabbi. And this Kirk Douglas said, the one gift I didn't give my kids was poverty. And I had poverty, boy. That was, that was a good gift. And I didn't give that to my kids. So yeah, hopefully Street, I won't. Though. What's that? Yeah, Wall Street, though. Yeah. He said he was bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, um, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> that comes out of your time, not mine. Um, so, thank you. So anyway, so I had poverty. Um, I eventually uh, got into something called the Warner Brothers Writers Program, which now I speak at sometimes. Um, and, um, and then I got a job. I, my first job was on a show called Hang Out with Mr. Cooper, and, um, and then I worked on a show called Duckman. And then, and then it was, um, you know, it was hiring season. I had nothing really stuck. And there were two shows that I wanted to get on. One show was called Blue Skies, and it was uh, about uh, these two guys and a, a girl who opened up a travel agency. And another show um, was uh, about a group of six people who grew up in New York around my age. And I knew, if I knew anything, I had a good instinct for this, I knew that one of these was going to be a hit. And I just said to God, all right, listen, do you remember the Ha Network thing? You really owe me. <laughs> if you really exist, please get me on Blue Skies. And <laughs> he forsook me again. I didn't get smoked. So I got on Friends, and then... Um, you know, it, uh, that changed my life. And I didn't know it at the time that it was changing my life. Um, if I did, I would have stayed on it longer. But, um, you know, it was an incredible experience, and I still, you know, have friends with them. I worked with one of the friends now, uh, Courtney, um, and a um, very lovely person. And, you know, the Friends experience was kind of, Friends was kind of a Jewish show. And, um, you know, all the writers, um, all the writers were Jewish. And um, I was the only one who took off for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Um, interesting. And there were all the, there were weird rules about the Jews on Friends. Like, like the fact, like Ross was Jewish, Monica wasn't kind of thing. <laughs> Rachel, unclear. They all were intermarried, which is a bummer. Like all their parents were intermarried and they didn't, they didn't care about who they dated. And uh, that, was, that was kind of a bummer to me. And, and I, remember, um, I remember one night, it was, the, um, it was the eighth night of Hanukkah, and I said, this is like one of those, this, is, this would be a good story for Angie Treblinka. Um, <laughs> that you hear these stories, uh, the horrors of the sitcom room. And I said, you know what, it's the eighth night of Hanukkah and we're a bunch of Jews. And I remember that I had made Joey's uh, Joey's roommate, his last name was Manoach, because my best friend growing up was Manoach. I remember I made his last roommate a Jew. I said, so I bet you there's a menorah on that set. So we went down to the set, 
and we got a we got a menorah, and we lit the candles, and all of us, remembering from Hebrew school, sang the you know sang, sang the brachas and the, the Hanukkah candles. We lit the Hanukkah candles, and then we we wrote the script to the light of the menorah, which actually I found out is you're not allowed to do that. But <laughs> we had a gigantic shamish. Um, but and then I just thought, and I looked at us all these Jews sitting around writing television around a menorah, and I said, this is exactly what America thinks happens in the writer's room. Like, but <laughs> Jews under the menorah. So, um, so friends shot on Friday nights. Most sitcoms shoot on Friday nights. And that wasn't, I didn't know, I didn't know Friday night was a special night. I knew that once again, I had my menhog. We went out to a place called Ribs USA. Um, you know, terrible, terrible. Um, you know, not good in any way. And, um, but that was it. Friday night was not different. Friday night was not different for me. And then after Friends, I met my wife. Um, I left, um, <laughs> is my wife here? <laughs> No, my, 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 wife, uh, my wife would not be clapping about that. <laughs> she, she hates that part of the story. Um, one more, please. For my wife. I love my wife. My wife's incredible. People here who've been to my Shabbos table know how much I love my wife and know that um, I have a great marriage and she does not. And... Um, <laughs> So I left, I left Friends after the, after the second season. I was called by, uh, Steven, by Jeffrey Katzenberg and Steven Spielberg. Um, actually, they called Jeffrey Katzenberg. I'd just seen an episode I had written of Friends called The One With All The Poker. And he said, uh, thank you. <laughs> no one said anything. <laughs> um, and um, he said, I want to hire these guys. And my agent hung up. He wasn't my agent after that moment. Um, he didn't believe it was Jeffrey Katzenberg, and then Steven Spielberg called and said, I want to meet them. And to my grandmother, who I wouldn't work on Yom Kippur, is like I had to work for Steven Spielberg. So I did, and I figured I would create the next friends, and I didn't. And here I am talking for free in Maury's Fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 I met my wife. And they say, thank you again, my wife. <laughs> my wife is over there. Um, they say you can't put a price on marriage. Mine cost me about $16 million. Um, <laughs> worth it, mostly. So, uh, no, thank God we have, a, we, have an amazing, we have an amazing marriage. And we have, uh, we have two beautiful children, three total. And <laughs> no, my kids, are, kids are fantastic. So when we first got married, when we first got married, we were talking about how we wanted to raise our kids. We decided, um, you know, we're going to raise we're going to raise them Jewish, and then, but we didn't know anything about what that meant to raise kids Jewish. My wife is very spiritual; she wanted a, our kids to have a relationship with God, and and I was like, oh, been kind of over two with God, <laughs> um, but sure. So let's learn about let's learn about this. What do we what do we actually believe in? I think a lot of Jews don't know what they believe in. I, there was a rabbi uh, named Rabbi Fran who has such a great line. He said. Um, you know, if you're going to be a conservative Jew or a reformed Jew, then that's fine. But know what you're conserving and know what you're reforming. So um, I did not know what I was conserving nor what I was reforming. So, um, you know, I went and we learned all these things and learned about Shabbos. And, and it was really incredible. I didn't realize what an incredible, other than like controlling entertainment and banks, I didn't realize... <laughs> All these things. By the way, I've had both of those industries. I haven't controlled either, so I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> but I didn't really realize the incredible, incredible uh, rich. Oh, thank you. Oh, boy. This, this is going to get worse from here, guys. <laughs> this, that's called enabling. Thank you. I'm not a drinker. I drink on, on Friday night. That's it. So it must be Friday night. Um, so... Um, I went with this group. I met this this couple right around uh, right around the block from here, in fact. And they took us to a um, a group called Arachim. Arachim is like uh, you know we'll call it a values. call it a, was it values. Values, great. It's val I didn't know that. That's, um, that's amazing. But I don't I don't think that's what it goes by. I think Arachim was kind of like the Asia of its time. You know, what I mean, like they had this program that that proved that the Torah came from God, and that was something I had <laughs> never ever ever considered before in my entire uh, Jewish life of uh, 30, probably 37, 38 years. I'd never even thought that the Torah came from God. It was something that I, that I didn't learn. 
Um, and um, we learned about, you know, Mount Sinai and that, that Judaism, I don't know if you know this, is the only religion that has a mass uh, revelation. Every other religion is like, you know, there's a guy in the cave or there's a guy, you know, who, who had a dream. Like, this was everybody. Like, this is a, it's a terrible way. You know, when you're writing a story, like, you look for, like, plot holes. It's like, this is a terrible way to tell a story if there are, you know, three million witnesses and, and you know, it's like, and we tell the story year after year after year after year. And it was like, wow, that's incredible. So it must, it must have happened if my grandparents did it, if, my, if everybody knew. Like, it's a really like, here's the plan. We're going to tell everybody what we're doing. Um, and it's really incredible. I never thought of these. So at the time, um, at the time, and this was the first time I kept Shabbos. In, in, and it was, in, it was a hotel, and they made all your food, so it was very, very easy. And the, they turned the TV on for you. No, they didn't. Um, <laughs> but it was like, programming and speeches and, and probably a lot of, of, of what you get here, maybe with better speakers. And um, definitely with better speakers. Um, <laughs> not you. No, this is incredible. I'm talking about tonight. So <laughs> Rabbi Chapnick, I'm not going to compete. So it was incredible. So at the time, I was our best friends were, uh, we had a reform rabbi and, and his reform wife. I'm not here to, you know, to dish on, on, on anybody um, other than these specific people. And uh, they were, but they were, they were our best friends at the time, my wife and my best friends. And he said, hey, I didn't see you. And I remember I'm driving. At this point, I'm working at a studio called CBS Radford, which is uh, in the Valley, Studio City. And I'm getting off of the, the 101 or the 134, I think the 101. Maybe the 170. <laughs> was it 101? Thank you. you. She was there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, this was before I had Waze, so I actually hired somebody to tell me where to go. So this is really important. Thank you. Left turn ahead. So um, I was getting off, and I remember back this dates the story because there's a little earpiece that went into my Sony Trio, and or Palm Trio, and um, I'm talking to my friend, and he said, "What do you do?" And I said, "We went on. Um, I had this incredible Shabbos. Now, of course, Shabbos. When you say Shabbos, it's a tell that something is awry." It's not Shabbat. He said, oh, what was it? I said, I learned that the Torah came from God. And I was so high about that one thought that I was created. For the first time, I thought, like, I was created, and I could have a relationship. And, and it made so much sense to me that if someone was going to create me, that there's someone, something, an entity would create me. If I had a creator, that means that the creator would want a relationship. Why would you create? Unless the creator is very, very cruel. Um, which didn't make sense, or doesn't care, which didn't make sense, because why would, as someone now who has kids, and you know how much you, even when you don't like them, you love them, um, you know, it's like you want that relationship, and, and I was like, well, there must be, like, rules to have a relationship, and then there is. There's a Torah, and there's, you know, thousands of pages of, of the rabbis really delving into what God wants from us to get close to him, and I was like, I could not believe this. It never dawned on me. And I'm talking about this, and my friend is silent. And then there's like, finally, like, I stopped to breathe. And I was like, you still there? And he said, I am so disappointed in you. <laughs> and I was like, what? And he goes, I wish you had given me a weekend where I could prove to you that the Torah did not come from God, but was written by men. And first of all, I can't believe that that would be your life's work um, <laughs> as a rabbi. But like, I remember feeling like it was like one of those guy, one of those like blow up things outside the thing. They, they unplug. It was like a bouncy house, and I was just like, I remember it was a bouncy house that just got unplugged, and I was just deflating, and then all of a sudden this white jeep cuts me off, and like that, it made a noise like that, and <laughs> that's good. Special effects, thank you, and it went. <laughs> A white Jeep comes to me, cuts me off right in front of me, and the license plate was halacha. <laughs> and all I could do was stare at that. Now, halacha is, is the law. Like, that's, that's the, the laws that we follow. And all I could do, and I stopped hearing my friend, and I followed that Jeep, and it went, and I drove. Um, <laughs> I followed the Jeep, and I followed the Jeep, and it passed my lot, and I went to the lot. I found out, like, a few years ago, the um, guy's name was Ralph Halacha, but um, no. <laughs> No, I actually found out the guy who's, and I said, what were you doing there? You changed my life. I was like, I saw this like incredible sign from God. I stopped listening to my friend. I was like, how could this be that like God sends this little angel? And, and I've kind of from that moment on, um, I've, I've lived my life um, looking for these like little signs, these little angels. And it was really, and they are 
everywhere. I mean, the angels are everywhere, like everything. You could look back and you could look at all the little things, all the little coincidences that happened, everything that gets you there, everything that you thought was bad that wound up being good. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is like, maybe there's a reason I got on Friends and not the show I wanted to be on. Maybe that was good for me. Um, but in a bigger sense, like all the things that happened to you, there's like, there's a, there's a, there's a loving God. And so I was, I was very, very excited. And um, so I told my dad and, and I was like, you know, I'm not going to work on Friday nights anymore. And of course, my father, who was very supportive of me moving out, said, the Orthodox are a cult. <laughs> so you, you go home for, for your love. And I said, Dad, you, your parents were Orthodox. And he said, they absolutely were not. And I said, your father went to an Orthodox shul. And he said, that was the only one that was close enough to walk to. <laughs> and I'm telling you, this is a true story. And I said, but your mother lit candles. And he said, only on Friday nights and holidays. <laughs> so uh, that's what I'm up against. Um, and the truth is, he was worried about me. He had just lost his job. I look back, and he had lost his job. And, and um, he was worried about me working, because every show, um, in, in my business, a show, most shows, 80% of them, back when they were like multi-camera shows, I don't know if you know the difference between a multi-camera show and a single camera show. A multi-camera show, if you've ever been to a show with an audience and laugh track, that's a multi-camera show. And how that works is it starts on a uh, Monday, you do a table read, and then Tuesday you do a big rewrite after that, and then Tuesday you do another rewrite, Wednesday you see a run-through, Thursday you do camera blocking after another late night and then Friday night is big show night and you go out to Ribs USA and then you watch the show and then you start over again on the, uh, on the Monday. So um, at the time my partner and I, so I was starting to keep Shabbos and um, you know as um, one of the other little miracles was that we worked on a show that, uh, e e yes, no we don't, no the Jeep did not, the Jeep is gone. Jeep is not in the story anymore. <laughs> Man, I hate. I know. I can't imagine who. Um, but it always happens when I talk about the Jeep. The Jeep hates this story. Um, anyway, I'll throw my, my new cup. Um, so um, I, I started working. Uh, I started working. The first show I started working on um, was, was uh, when I started keeping Shabbos was um, a show and starred Elon Gold. If you know Elon, you probably know Elon because he charges to speak. <laughs> which, is, which is why I'm here. So I want to thank Elon for charging to speak since I'm free. Um, so, so Elon, um, and I didn't even realize this because, you know, they say that, like, God puts the, the, the cure before the disease. And I didn't realize this because I didn't start keeping, I started working on the show. I didn't know. And then I started keeping Shabbos. And, you know, my wife and I started keeping Shabbos when we had our daughter. And I was like, well, I'm going to stay home on Friday nights to um, bless my daughter and to light the candles and to sing Shalom Aleichem and to have dinner with my wife. And then it was like, and I'll come back to work. But then it didn't make sense to come back to work after that, going from a speech, such a spiritual high to having to write for Elon Gold was just, it didn't, um, you know, Elon is a, a dear friend, and um, it didn't make sense. So I was like, I can't work Fridays anymore. I can't work Friday nights anymore. And they said, okay, so you'll work Saturdays. Um, <laughs> everyone hated me so much because um, we started working Saturdays. And then eventually it was like, ah, I can't work Saturdays either. <laughs> And um, that, that show ended mercifully. Um, and the next show I worked on was a show called, I realize I'm saying these things you haven't heard of, but you know, whatever, it's, it got me where I am. It's a show called Grounded for Life. It was a, a, a nice show. And I took over the show with, with um, we took over from these two other guys. And um, the, um, that show also shot on a Friday night. And my partner at the time, I have a writing partner, and my partner is Jewish. And um, the show shoots on Friday nights. And you know, we start, you know, we start talking. And um, he said, "Listen, we got to talk about the Friday night thing." And I said, um, "Yeah, I'm not going to work on Friday nights." And now the show night—you have to understand, like show night is the big—it's the big, 
it's the big production. Like if you've ever seen a play, it's like imagine like you create a play, but then you don't show up for the play. Like that's what it is. This is where everything happens. You do a lot of rewriting on the night, on Friday night, because things fall apart. If you've ever been to a TV show, you see the writers come in. It doesn't happen so much anymore because not that many multi-camera comedies, but you work a lot. Friday night's the hardest night of the week. And he said, I need you to be there. This is our first time we're running the show together. Um, and I said, well, what if we shoot on a different night? And he's like, I don't want to make waves. So I checked, and it turns out that they used to show, shoot that show on a Tuesday night. So I said, let's shoot on a Tuesday night. They're like, absolutely not. The actors hated it. They liked being done on Friday. So he said to me, you have to work on Friday night. He said, we, we split the money 50-50. We're both Jews. His nose was even bigger than mine. So he, <laughs> believe it or not, and so... I couldn't argue. And he said, why? I'm less Jewish than you. I'm not less Jewish. And he, you know, by, I, I don't know how you, how you judge that, but um, certainly physically he was not less Jewish than I was. <laughs> so um, we had a standstill. And then, so then at that moment, the head of the studio calls us and he says, I need you to come to my office. So we're like not talking to each other. And he comes in and, you know, he said, listen, he goes, I just heard from the network and they don't want the show to be a multicam anymore because it's too expensive and we have to cut the budget. So what we're going to do is we're going to shoot the show over two days. We're going to shoot it over Thursday and Friday. One of you will work late Thursday and one will work Friday. <laughs> and I said, I'll take Thursday. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, this is really makes up for this whole ha thing. This is like really great. Like I'm, I'm, and, and I look at it like I'm, I'm, you step off it was like one Indiana Jones movie and like where you step off a thing and you like the thing comes up to you and that's kind of how I look at it. I was like, wow, this is very interesting. So um, my partner left me right after that. We broke up and I always wish him a lot of, you know, luck but less than me. And, <laughs> but I had to look for a job and you always, uh, you know, most writing teams stay together because they're afraid that the other person is going to do better. He got a job right away. And that was a bummer to me. So um, I had to go out looking for a job. I thought, oh, this is great. I cut that dead weight, and like I soar, and no. Um, and thank you. you. You know what I'm talking about. Um, and um, so I went to look for a job. But the question was, do I tell people that I don't work Friday nights? And I'm like, and again, I'm just, I'm really just starting out at this not Friday night thing. And it's like, is this, but I'm like, I committed to it. And like, do I tell people that I'm not working Friday night? So my wife and I decided, and it's like a, it's a, you know, it's kind of like, I decided that I would wait until I got the job and then I would tell them. I would wow them. And then I had a speech. And it's <laughs> incredible. Listen to this speech. I'll say, I can't work Friday nights, but I will be the first person in and the last person to leave Monday through Thursday. I will work any non-Jewish holiday for you, and I guarantee you that I will produce more than any other person in that room where you could fire me, no questions asked. So that's a speech I had. That's a pretty good speech. That's powerful. That's powerful. You know what? Drop the bottle there. I don't know why you're waiting for the Jeep. That's a, that's a powerful speech. Because my, my rationale at the time was, you know, you don't go out on a date with someone and say, like, right when you're ordering, I have irritable bowel syndrome. <laughs> oh, you'll find out. <laughs> but I want to let you know. No. You know what I mean? You're going to get the check. It's going to be fast. It's going to be, you're going to be eating less than I did tonight. So that's what I was going to do. I was going to go and I was going to uh, wait until I had the job. And I wasn't going to tell them. So I had five interviews, all with Jewish showrunners. Every single one of them, the first thing they said was, I heard you don't work Friday nights. <laughs> that's all they talked about. It is all they talked about. I said, no, I don't. And I said, okay. What if it's your episode? Will you work Friday night for your episode? I will not. OK, what if, what if the head of the network is going to be there that night and he wants to see you for your episode? That's never happened, but no. <laughs> what if we don't make you light a fire? It's like, I don't imagine you make me light a fire on a Tuesday. So um, <laughs> no, that's not a thing. And they said, so what do you do? And I said, I go home. On Friday night, I go home on Friday afternoon. And I get home before, before sundown. And they said, but what happens if you're driving home and the sun goes down? <laughs> I said, well, the, I know what time the sun is going down for the next 3,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> 
if it goes down before then, we have bigger problems than I'm working on finding out. <laughs> that was a conversation with every single one of them. Every single, every single showrunner was just determined to find out what it would take for me to work on a Friday night. I got all five job offers. Incredible. But I didn't want to work on any of those shows. There was a show I wanted to work on that I read the script for. It was called New Adventures of Old Christine. It starred Julie Lee Dreyfus. It got her her first Emmy, which she wrote me a nice letter for because it was an episode I wrote. I wrote the first episode of that show. I wrote the first episode of Friends. That wasn't the pilot also. But I, I wrote the first episode of the show. And um, I really wanted this. I really wanted this job. And it was just through a whole bunch of like little miracles that I, I wound up even getting to meet on this show, and I had an amazing, amazing interview with this woman. Her name is Carrie Lizer, as Gentile as Gentile could be. She could star in, as the villain in Angie Treblinka. That's how Gentile, <laughs> that's how Gentile she looked. I'm realizing this, this tape is no longer showable to anybody. Um, <laughs> thank you. As it will be after I finish this wine. Um, so um, Carrie and I had a great we really had a great meeting. It was also, um, it was just like a lot of little miracles happened in the meeting I want to talk about. But so I wind up getting the job offer. And um, my agent says, what do you want to do about the other jobs? And I said, um, let him go. He said, OK, you're going to take this job. I go, yes. So he lets go. He tells the other shows, I'm not going to take uh, that job. This is fantastic. And I go, wait a minute. I didn't tell, my, I didn't tell her that I don't work on Friday nights. Why didn't it come up? because she was a Gentile. Um, and she didn't know that about me. So um, it didn't come up. So he said, OK, well, what does that mean? I said, well, if the show, f I have to tell her that, or I won't get the job. And I, he said, well, she can fire you. I said, she can't fire me. That's discrimination. He said, you, she can fire you for whatever she wants. There's no such thing as discrimination. And I said, well, some people respect that. And then he said, my Jewish agent said, I don't. <laughs> And then he laughed for 90 straight seconds. And I, <laughs> I challenge you to do anything for 90 seconds. Like, you can't talk for 90. Like, the phone got hot. It was like, <laughs> I'm represented by Satan. <laughs> so he said, well, I already told the other shows you don't have a job. Uh, so you can do what you want. I said, I have to tell her that I don't work Friday nights. So I called her up, and I had my speech, that very powerful speech that should have got the, the bottles breaking over. <laughs> I had that ready and prepared. And I said, listen, Carrie, this is great. I really want to take this job. I have to tell you something. Um, I said, I don't work Friday nights. And I know that's show night. She goes, no, no, I, I always shoot on a Tuesday. She had come from a show called Will and Grace, and they always shot on Tuesday because one of the showrunners of Will and Grace um, liked to be home with his family on Friday nights. Jewish guy. And um, he knew. He knew about Shabbat. And he wanted to be home Friday night. So it wasn't strictly Shomer Shabbos, but it was good. So I said, so she said, we shoot on Tuesdays. So Friday won't be a problem. I said, that, that is great news. But I, you know, I just so you know, I, I, don't, I don't work on Friday nights, though, for a reason. She goes, that's fine. <laughs> I said, do you, do you want another reason? <laughs> She says, are religious? I said, yes. She goes, it's fine. <laughs> I said, I have a very powerful speech. She said, it's OK. <laughs> I never got to give my powerful speech. <laughs> By the way, I will give you a spoiler alert, because we're running out of time here. I will tell you this. I've been working. I've been Shomer Shabbos now uh, for uh, like 16, 17 years. I've never had to give that powerful speech wow. until tonight. <laughs> Anyway, that was incredible. And I hung up the phone. I was like, God, thank you so much for this. Thank you. You know, what a, what a, what a miracle. I mean, I have all the shows. And really, 80% of the shows shoot on Friday night. I have an understanding showrunner who um, didn't even ask the question. And I didn't even have to give my very powerful speech. And this is amazing. So I look at. So I didn't look at the calendar, but let me tell you something about the calendar. Uh, sitcoms, back, back in the day when before it was like, you know, shows come out every two years. Um, back then, uh, shows come out, shows, uh, the hiring season is uh, April and May. There's a two-week window where you, every, everybody gets hired, really like a one-week window. After that, the shows, every show starts. The room starts the first uh, day after um, 
after Memorial Day, which is usually like June 1st, uh, every show starts. So this is the first time I'm on my own as a writer. My friend already got a job, actually ironically, with the guys from Will and Grace. Um, this is my first time being on my own. Like somebody trusted me and somebody was like, yes, I think you can do this. And this is fantastic. And I did not have to look at the calendar to know that that very first day of work was going to be chivalrous. And I did not, I didn't even have to know. I was like, oh, okay, God, I see what you did. <laughs> Yeah, let me slip with Shabbos, and now we have Shavuos. Now, I, so I call my agent back, and he's like, I'm about to sign a deal. Congratulations. I go, not so fast. <laughs> he goes, um, what, what now? I thought you worked off at the Friday thing. I said, yes. I said, uh, it's Shavuos. He said, what's that? <laughs> it's when we got the Torah, and we eat ice cream. He hung up. <laughs> So here I am now with no job, <laughs> potentially. And I didn't, by the way, I didn't have a Shavua speech. I just got the Shava speech. Like, like no one has a Shavua speech. Like you work on Shabbos, you work enough days, and then finally it's like Shavua. And um, so I'm like, OK, I got to just find and replace Shabbos Shavua. And I called up, and I was like, Carrie, can we talk about when we're starting? She said, look, I have a house in. Um, in Vermont that I like to go through for June. Do you mind if we start in July? I said, fine, but you owe me. And <laughs> um, it wound up being an amazing, amazing relationship. Um, everybody there knew. In fact, it got so good. And you know, you have to explain these holidays as you're going along. And this is also an issue with I was just learning. I was taking on more and more, um, more and more stuff at this point. I didn't just become, you know. Um, Overnight, so you know, and there was stuff because there was, you know, I would the first season I would eat sushi out, and then the second season I was just like strictly, you know, kosher and whatnot. I think it was a little bit, it was a little bit confusing, but you know, eventually, you know, it's like I got to go for Sukkot, and they're like, is that the holiday? What's that holiday? Is that the holiday with the lemon? I was like, it's a esrog, but yes. <laughs> but then eventually, whenever she got annoyed with me, she'd say, "Isn't it Shabbos?" I was like, "It's Tuesday." She's like, "Can you?" <laughs> Can you just go? Isn't it, <laughs> isn't it like pinch matuchas or something? I'm like, OK. So um, you know, that was that, was, um, that was that was that job. And I worked there for five years, and it was uh, incredible. Let me, let me get to, um, let me get to uh, where I am today, because I have a bunch of little miracles along the way um, that happened to me. But I'll tell you the last one. The last one, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on the show now um, with, uh, with Courtney Cox. By this point, everybody knows I don't work on Friday nights, and I don't work on Shavuos, and I don't work on Simchas Torah, and everyone loves it. Let me tell you something. People are like, you know, why don't you hold Rabbein of Tom? They love having, that's like the extra like 40 minutes, like because they love having 25 hours off from me. It is <laughs> such a miracle, like everybody. And by the way, the Jews who work for me don't have to, uh, don't have to go, don't have to work on any Jewish holidays, don't have to work any Fridays. My assistant is Jewish, never works when I'm not there, never. And I told her that. And it was really nice. I had these two writers. I worked on the show Trial and Error. And I said, you know what? I said, um, I said, what do you guys do for Yom Kippur? I said, usually we work. Or Rosh Hashanah. I said, they said, usually we work. I said, not this year. This year you have two days off for Rosh Hashanah. And they were like, you know what? No one's ever said that. And they sent me pictures of them at the Dodger game. But <laughs> I like the first part of that story. That second part never happens before another glass of wine. Um, so um, this is the last. So, so right now, I know it's easy. I have a friend called Alana Warnick, uh, who also, she, was, she, was, she grew up observant. So it's never a question. It's not a hard thing for her to say, I don't work on Friday in Shabbos. It's like, you know, you, you just don't. There's certain things that you can't do. I can't be in the NBA. She doesn't work on that. For me, it was harder <laughs> because I took on these, I took on these, um, these things slower, you know, slowly. And now, like I said, now everybody knows. Um, and so ne Friday is never questioned. The, the studio, the studio uh, works their schedule around me. Um, like I said, they shut down for Sukkot. They know that we're, we're, you know, I have people in place on Friday afternoons for me uh, if we have to work. No Jew ever works. Uh, who works for me has to work on Shabbos or Yontif. And the studios know that. They know when not to call me, when to call me. So 
Uh, two years ago, I don't, do you guys remember COVID? <laughs> it's been probably for your time. So it's two days ago. So I shot my pilot in, I think it was in it was February, of, uh, it must have been February of 2021, and it was um, serious, serious COVID. And they were just like, and, and they had a, and we had shut down for a year. Like we couldn't do it. And there was only nine days that I could possibly shoot my pilot. And what a pilot is, is you shoot the first episode of the show. And if they like it, they pick up the whole show and then you work. If they don't like it, then you don't work. It's a very, very simple equation. And um, so I'm shooting my pilot and I have a great cast. I have Courtney Cox and I have Greg Kinnear and I have Mira Savino and I have a lot of talented people. And we're shooting in this street in Pasadena that you can only shoot in six days a year, and we had those six days, we wound up getting those six days. Now the only caveat was that Warner Brothers, because he couldn't get insurance for COVID, had a rule that if uh, it's, it's two strikes, if two people in zone A, zone A are people who can um, touch or speak to the actors directly. I have in my contract, I have to be able to touch every actor at any time. <laughs> That's not true. But I am in zone A. So it's me, the directors, hair and makeup and wardrobe, basically. They're the only people who can, and the other actors, who can speak. And by the way, you're dressed like an astronaut at this point. I don't know if you remember, like back in that, you know, everyone's a beekeeper. Um, and, um, you know, so there's a two strike law, two strike rule. If two people in zone A got tested positive for COVID, then the show shuts down, that's it. Now, I only had six days the, to shoot this show in this location. If the show shut down, that's my, this, everything I've been, I've been working on this show for two years at this point. Everything goes away, because they can't shoot it again. It can't shoot for another year. It goes away. It's a $9 million pilot. So um, the show starts, we start shooting on a Tuesday. On Wednesday, the first case of COVID. I was like, wow, that was fast. Somebody from wardrobe had tested positive for COVID. Thankfully, uh, Greg and Courtney um, did not test positive for COVID. And the reason is because they said, like, what if, you know, if Courtney Cox gets COVID or somebody gets COVID, they could, back then, it was, you know, we, did, we didn't know as much as we don't know today. And, um, <laughs> but people were dying. And I, you know, I, I lost friends. And, um, Hate to bring the room down. Sorry, guys. Um, but you know they were more concerned that somebody could you know sue for fifty million dollars. So the show was done. So they're like, okay, you have one strike left. I was like, well, this seems this is like it's a crazy game of whack-a-mole because how are you not going to get COVID? So um, it was that Friday, and it was in the winter. It was February. I know that because it was right before my birthday. My birthday's coming up, guys. <laughs> February twenty fourth. If I come into this room and everyone yells surprise. I will love that. <laughs> I will love that. It's a Friday night. It's a Friday night, so you don't have to you don't have to film it or give gifts. But Robert Markman, I hope that you reserve this room. Who's ever here? Let's reserve this room Friday. Night. Yeah, it is a Friday. We'll see you in three in one month, right here in this room. It's um, so uh, yes. I, I'll give my Shabbat speech. It'll be amazing. Yes, I hope so. So. So this is, Friday, this is Friday afternoon, I'm in, I'm in South Pasadena, and I'm getting ready to leave, because it's Friday in February, which means I have to leave at like two o'clock. And um, so I have everything in place. I have all my Gentiles running everything. And, <laughs> and, and plus a monkey running the cameras. It's in fact, every, every stereotype you can think of happened. And um, it was incredible. And I'm talking to Courtney, and she's wearing a mask. And I said to her, I said, look, here, just so you know, um, I'm going now. But this person's in charge, Jill, my number two. She's, um, she's going to be in charge. I told everybody everything they have to do. I'm making this show. The show is not mine. I mean, the show is not mine anyway. It's, uh, you know, Warner Brothers runs it. And, and I said, but this is what it's going to be. I'm going to be gone. I'm unreachable. And then she's just nodding and nodding. I said, you understand? Courtney. She said, oh, I'm not Courtney. I go, what? <laughs> it, it was Courtney's stand-in. But she's wearing a mask. And I said, why didn't you tell me you weren't Courtney? She said, because I, I, I was so flattered. I said, okay, thank you. This is, <laughs> you just wasted my last six minutes before I have to get home. And because who knows, according to a lot of people, the sun could just drop out of the sky at any moment and I have to walk home. Anyway, I, um, I go home. I make my plans. 
And that day on Shabbos, I have my regular Shabbos. Now, my sister is, uh, is, is not observant, but she knows enough. And it was, it's a rough time. You find that with family sometimes. They don't understand, and, and they, you know, they do the same calculus that everybody does about what if this happens, what if someone dies, how do you do this? And, and we've, had, we've had things happen. But thank God, nothing really big has ever happened on the Shabbos. It seems to be OK, Leonora. So, um, so my sister knows now, because it's been 16, 17 years, never to call me at Shabbos. She knows I'm not answering the phone. So um, it's Shabbos, and uh, you know, and my show had filmed last night, and then all of a sudden the phone rings, and I still have, and I don't even know why I have a landline, but I, I think you're supposed to. And I don't even know why I have this kind of machine that announces who's calling, but I think you're supposed to. And it says, my sister's name is, is Liz Aronauer, and it says, call from Elizabeth Aronauer. It's... 12.30 on Saturday afternoon, and the phone rings, and it's my sister. Now, that could only mean one thing. There's, there's nothing it could mean except, God forbid, something happened to my dad. That's the only thing. My sister won't even call my dad. She's so afraid of him dying. And thank God he's in good health. But um, this, the only thing that could mean is that it's Saturday, and I'm sitting there and staring at the phone. And I said to my wife, I said, that could only mean one thing. Liz would only call for one reason. And then I thought, I said, all right, let's go have lunch. And my wife is like, what are you going to do? I said, there's nothing I can do. Like, right now, it's Shabbos. Like, right now, everything is fine in the world. And there's nothing I can do. Because it's not my dad lives in Vegas. And God willing, he should live to 120. Now you know the end of the story. Um, but there's nothing I could do. Like, picking up that phone was not going to do anything. I couldn't save his life. And of course, for Shabbos, you could break Shabbos and save a life. There's nothing more important than Judaism than saving a life. And um, I couldn't do anything. So I was like, you know what? Right now I have like these, you know, last five hours of just nothing is wrong in the world. And so we went about our day, and we had Shabbos. Of course, the second Shabbos is over, the second half dollar is over, I checked my phone. I have like 15 missed calls, 23 texts. I comb through them, comb through them, comb through them. Not one of them is from my sister. I'm like, that's very weird. Um, I can't get that many spam calls. So what had happened was, so I called my, my producer. And um, I, she said, and, finally, and by the way, the text started coming in. It's like, sundown is 532. Where are you? It's 534, even if you did a very slow half dollar, you should be done. These are all Gentiles. <laughs> oh, what are you, Rabbeinu Tom now? Like, all Gentiles. And then I go, what happened? So here's what happened. So my producer also, um, what happened was that somebody tested positive for COVID um, on Friday afternoon, and we had to shut down. But in order to shut down, they needed me to sign off on it. And um, so my they called the head of production at Warner Brothers, called my producer, um, her name was Dana Honor, and they called her and they said that we need to get Jeff to sign off on this. We have to shut the show down. They said, I, I think Jeff is unreachable. And she said, nobody's unreachable. And that's the whole thing in my business, nobody's unreachable. But Jeff is unreachable. So the producer happened to have know my sister. So she said, they said, so the, producer, so the head of production at Warner Brothers said, call his sister. She could reach him. So they called my sister, and my sister said, he's unreachable. And there's nothing. Even if, God forbid, something happened to her father, he's not going to pick up the phone. Because <laughs> <laughs> they wanted me to pick up the phone just so they could sign off on this. So I didn't pick up the phone. And I said, what happened? So I called my other producer, and I said, what happened? And I said, oh, my God, you couldn't believe this. You're going to pick up the phone. Blah, blah. And then um, said, well, they, there was another test for COVID, they were going to shut you down, but they couldn't. So instead, they spent $30,000 to get a mobile lab to go over to Greg's house and Courtney's house and all the actors' house. And they've never done this before, but since they couldn't reach you, they wound up testing everybody and we're fine. <laughs> Wait, so did someone test positive? And then someone tested positive, some of the wardrobe. Then they spent. Later and found out the person was actually negative. No, they, somebody tested positive in wardrobe, which was zone A. 
And because of that, they were going to shut down the show, but they needed me to sign oh. off on that. So since they couldn't get me to sign off on this, they spent the money to get a mobile lab. This was before like little rapid tests. <laughs> to get a mobile lab to go to each of the actors' houses, $30,000 that came out of our budget because I wouldn't answer the phone. And <laughs> so two years later, I'm still working on the show. So it was a, um, it was a gift. It's all a gift. And I'll just leave you with this. I, I remember I was in a casting session with all Jewish people back when there were Jewish people in, in Hollywood. And uh, that dates the story a little bit. And we were just talking. And they all said, I wish there was one day that I could put down the phone. I wish there was just one day. I just like, I wish someone made me do that. And it's like you have one day. It's the biggest gift that you have is Shabbos. And I can't guarantee you that you're never going to get, never going to miss something. And my, you know, like I said, my dad was worried that once I started keeping Shabbos, I wouldn't, uh, my career would suffer. And, you know, thank God it's, it's gone the opposite direction. And, and I can't say it's because. I keep Shabbos, but I could tell you this, that my life has more meaning. And of all the people who are in this room of celebrities and rabbis, I ran first to the rabbis uh, in this room because those are the people who give my life meaning now, including Rabbi Markman, who's developing Angie Treblinka. Um, <laughs> and uh, I will tell you, if you give yourself this gift, the gift that God has given you. And again, my good friend, Rabbi David Aaron, said, when I asked him, I was having a crisis of faith early on. And he said, look, he said, here's what I know. He said, like, can I prove to you 100% the Torah is true? 100% no, I cannot. He said, but I know I'm not going to get to the other side. I'm not going to find anybody else laughing at me. And he said, because only God can invent Shabbos to take 25 hours off in this room full of people that wish they had 25 hours off. You have that 25 hours off. It's been my experience that God has always met me halfway. Anyway, that's my story, and that leads me to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, once more, please. Thank you. Thank you. All right, great. Thank beautiful. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So anyone who wants, uh, we'll take some questions. Anyone wants to? This is the this is the question part, except for the guys who just interrupted my thing and the bottle <laughs> woman. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. I don't want to stop because so you. Did you have an acting credit on Friends, or was it like a writing and producing credit, or both? So I just had a writing credit. Although you may recognize me as guy at the next to Joey at the hockey game. <laughs> Uh, I was in the it was in the, the the title sequence for years. Is that like what I played a lot of characters, none credited. One guy was I came into the party and it was very hot, and this is me hot. <laughs> See, I'm a great actor. One was the puck. I had like very long hair and a black beard, and the puck was coming towards uh, Joey and me, and it hit Ross in the nose, and I was so upset. And since I wasn't allowed to talk, I went like this. <laughs> And another one was I was when Rachel was uh, Ross was Rachel was waiting for Ross to come off the plane, and we were waiting for the plane to come in, and I was late. And how do you know I was late? I checked my watch and went like this. <laughs> so yes, I should have had acting credits, but no. Uh, I, I came out here and I did uh, I did stand up comedy for uh, in New York, um, and uh, I did not want to be a comic. Um, it's I, I thankfully. Um, Thankfully, it uh, shows a slightly, only marginally easier job, which is writing. But uh, yeah, so I have uh, writing credit. Friends was only my second job, so I, had, I was a little story editor. Sometimes it's more fun to write jokes than to tell them, right? Oh, 100% of the time. That's why I don't tell any jokes up here. Yes. <laughs> so it seems like you started to become more observant, like after you probably had your foot in the door. Yes. In the industry, for Jews who are early in the career, trying to get their foot in the door, like what's your advice to trying to figure out like how to observe holidays, but also you don't want to say no to opportunities that could be like a big. So I, I would say this. So it's very funny. What did I tell you? I said, I told Robert Markman, I said, one person is going to ask me what Jennifer Anderson is like, and one person is going to ask me, if you're starting out now, how do I do it? And I want to keep shopping. So I can only tell you my, I, I can only tell you my experience. Um, you know, it was, yes, it was easier for me. It was actually easier for my friend Alana Berenson, who grew up 
from who was you know the only from woman uh, writer because she knew that's who she was and that's what she did. I, I would say this, like I would say that speech that I've never had to give that I gave to you, it has to be true. You have to be better. You have to be really great at it. This is not a, the reason I tell people not to do this career, like if I ever talk to somebody and they say, I say, what do you want to do? Because everybody has a script and everybody, not a script, people don't have scripts. People have dreams of wanting to do this. And they say, well, I want to be a writer or, and I said, do the aura <laughs> because it's brutal. It's brutal. You put yourself out there every day. It's constant rejection. You really have to have so much bitach and so much faith that, you know, my contract is up in, in five months. I don't know what I'm going to do the day after that is up. But I have faith that if God wants me to keep, you know, living in my house and giving as much money as I do to charities and paying for my kids' Jewish education, it'll be fine. If God hates me, on the other hand, I'm kidding. God forbid. <laughs> um, you know, if God has a different path for me, that I've accepted that. So I would say that you, you learn, you keep up with... The most important thing, the reason I started becoming observant was because I was surrounded by really, really, really wealthy, successful, quote unquote, people. And they were miserable. And all I wanted to do was make money when I got out here. And all the rich people, I met billionaires who were so afraid of losing their money. And uh, I mean, Shlomo Melech says that in Kohelis, uh, King Solomon. But like, you know, when you have, you know, you, you can't go to sleep when you have so much money. And I met people like that. I was like, well, it's not money, then what is it? And it's meaning. So I think the most important thing is to have meaning, to have faith in God. It's, it's always worked for me. And it might not be the right industry for you just because it's, it's a very, very difficult industry. And it's not going to be not the right industry for you because you keep Shabbos. It's not going to be the right industry for you because you don't have, God didn't give you that skill or because there's another opportunity waiting for you for something else. But if you're great at it and you're getting like, and you're getting reinforcement, it's easier for a woman, candidly. Um, are you black? <laughs> are you, were you born a woman? Yeah. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> were you, okay, so it, it's easier, no, diversity, diversity is a very, very big thing right now. Diversity is a big thing, and women are always a big thing. And, but you know what the biggest thing is? It's really, it's really God-given talent. And if you have the talent and you're being reinforced by that, then you do it. And you say, these are my rules. Um, you know, especially for a low-level person, an entry-level person, it depends. If you're a PA, it might be more difficult. Um, but like, you know, production assistant, it might be more difficult. But, um, you know, if you're starting as a writer and you're really, really good, you know, you're, there, you're, there's so little expected of you anyway as a, as a writer. So I would just say, you know, know what's important. For me, I found out afterwards I couldn't do it any other way. The most important thing in my life right now is my faith, and that's the, the thing that, I'm, the thing that I'm, I'm, I'm most proud of is, is God willing being in MetLife Stadium with uh, Rabbi Markman and having a slightly better seat. <laughs> Did, uh, Robinson? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> yes, 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 of course. As soon as my name was on TV, he was proud of me. Um, no, the truth is he was. And the truth is I look back on it and it was like he had just lost his job and he was worried for me. He is my biggest fan. He knows, he knows the news before it breaks. He's like, you hear about this? Is what's happening there? What about? I heard your numbers went down. Like he is, but he is, such a, he is such a big fan. And he also said to me, I remember a couple of, he was out here a few weeks ago, and uh, my wife and I were, were honored for, for something or other, and, and he, said, um, he said, I'm so proud of what you've done with your, for your community and how important you are in your community and, and what you've done you know, with your family, what a great family you have. And I told my sister, and she said, oh, no, Daddy's dying. And, um, <laughs> but yes, he has. It, it is very important to say that, that he has, and it, and it comes from a place of love. Yes? Uh, when you're just starting out, um, the uh, two things. First off, um, and I'm sure you've read this probably in, in your studies that there's a story specifically in the Talmud that uh, something that Elijah is looking and saying like, "Who is here for the world to come?" And at one point, he points to two people and they say that they're comedians. So you are, you know, still very much. Yeah, they they always look at me and they say, "All right, well, I guess he gets it too." Yes, I've heard that story a thousand times <laughs> about me. It's like even though you're this animal, I'm sure you've got a place in. I, I was just trying to be nice. Thank um, you. <laughs> no, um, my question is, uh, you know, you mentioned that as, like, on Friends, you know, Ross could be Jewish, Mom couldn't, Rachel was kind of, you know, wishy-washy about that. 
have you been able to incorporate Jewish stories into the things that you've been able to tell, into the stuff that you've created, whether it actually is a Jewish story, whether you heard it as a Jewish story, whether you're incorporating Jewish values? It's very, it, it is a great question. I, um, so I try not to write Jewish characters mm -hmm. because I don't want to, because in, or in my, I do comedy and people have to behave poorly and I don't want Jews to be represented that way. I had a Jewish character in my last story and I was made short that his, he was not halakhically Jewish. Um, and it was only I knew and you know, the, the <laughs> I, I had his, 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 uh, his trembly tree back to, um, but so I try to do that. I do use a lot, of, there, was a, there was actually a Charlie Harari story I used in one of my episodes uh, that I had a character quote. And I always try to quote, I do quote, I do quote stories in Agatha and I do use those stories. I mean, you know, the, the greatest, greatest source of story in the world is, is the Torah. You know, I mean, everything comes from there. So, but in terms of my, I try not to write about Jewish characters um, unless it's positive. Um, so I don't write about them because it's just, it's too dangerous, too slippery slope. It's, in fact, I was asked to, uh, write the American version of Shtesel. I don't know if you've seen the show Shtesel. So it's actually a very, very funny story. Um, so the show Shtesel was coming out, and Warner Brothers, the head of Warner Brothers, calls me and he said, Do you want to write Shtesel? I said, and It's like, you're the Jewiest guy we know. <laughs> Obviously, you would write Shtesel. And um, so I said, yeah, I love Shtesel. So I didn't know how to do it in America because the thing that I love about Shtesel, it takes place in Geula, it's a whole thing. And I had my own... I had my own kind of take on it, but um, so I met with um, one of the six people who claim to have, it's the most Israeli thing ever. I met with like three different people who claim to have the rights to Shtesel. <laughs> it's like, do you have the rights? He said, don't worry about the rights. We have better than rights. Like, <laughs> that doesn't sound right. I'm worried about the rights. No, you, you, you like the story. We get the rights. Don't worry. Like, nah. I don't think that's how it works. So, um, but yes, but if you're, you are, and by the way, there is more, I have a good friend of mine who does this thing called Jew in the City, which is um, uh, Allison Joseph's. It's, it's an organization that's like, tries to get Jews portrayed better on TV. And it's a very, it's a difficult thing because this is certainly religious Jews. And I know that you saw there's a, there was a, a, a show, um, it's called The Patient. Yes, and there was like a yeah, there was a there's a whole storyline, and actually a friend of mine was the consultant on it to know you know about the Jewish. I didn't like that they didn't say show a single Orthodox person smile in the whole thing, but um, you know that's a different thing. But it, it is you know, look, it, it is it is the tension you know in in a world where you know every everybody's like oh you should do a you should do a show about our Gemara here. It's like for people who don't have TVs, you know. <laughs> Um, so that, that's my, the short answer is I try not to make Jews behave badly. Yes? I was going to ask you, um, of all the characters that you've gotten the chance to write or to work on or just to create from scratch, which one do you relate to most? Look, I, there's a part of me in every character that I write to. You know, I, I could write to, you know, I, 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 every day, and people always ask, which character did you write for on Friends? And it's like, it's not. That's not that's not really that's not really how it works. But I, I will say this that like even even in a situation like that, even to this day, if I have trouble with a moment or a beat, I will take a moment, I'll take a walk, and I'll go, Hashem, help me through this beat. I really need I need insight here. And I say every morning I, I, I come into the office and I say a prayer. I said, Please God, let me be smart, let me be funny, let me be a good leader and not do anything bad for the Jews. And I'm successful usually in three or four of those things. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's hard to say. There's a part of me, and every character that I create is certainly a part of me. And, um, you know, but also, like, you know, it, it's even, even people who are non-religious don't know where the work comes from. And that's, that's just another proof of God, like you're taking something that just comes from nowhere. And even, like, non-religious people are like, yeah, I don't know where that came from. Like, you could read something that you wrote, and it's just like... How did that come out? So it's just the, this creativity. Yes? Um, sorry, it's a bit of a dark question, but is anti-Semitism something you're worried about when you're making content or projects? Do you feel like it's not just that you want to misrepresent Jews, but like if you have an idea for a great Jewish story, are you thinking, oh, less of the world wants to see it? Um, I, look, I think that when they came to me, when Warner Brothers came to me with Stissel, they said, here's where you can sell it, nowhere. 
So yes, I do think that is a th I, I do think that is a thing. You know, again, there is more like there is more Jewish programming. I don't think it's necessarily anti-Semitism, but I, I do think. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I when I wrote for Ground Floor, I did a joke about a character going to Jewish camp, and so I got a call immediately saying, uh, "We want our characters to be secular." Like, what does that mean? That means not Jewish. So, and it was the same thing. Like, you never mentioned like religion on Friends. So I don't know. If it's anti-Semitism. I think that Jews have a tricky relationship, and I think it's like why we've kind of gone into entertainment was because it was a field that no one else went into. So we kind of like, you know, we kind of like hide always a little bit. Um, I definitely feel it's hard to say there's not there's not anti-Semitism, um, you know, but. I'm not so concerned about that, but they, you know, I know that it's come up more and more that they've told me you can't hire more Jews, like for writers. They said, like on my last show on the show Trial and Error, I had this euphemism because it was when I was in Oregon. Where's the rabbi from Oregon? There we go. Hi. When I was in when I was in uh, when I was in Oregon, I was at this festival at, at, at U of O. There was like a you know this crest festival around around July 4th. And somebody said, oh, are you a Northeasterner? And I was like, oh, I'm going to use that. That means Jew. <laughs> and then uh, so, I, so I used that in my show about Northeasterners uh, being Jewish. And they told me, Warner Brothers said, you have to hire fewer Northeasterners. Um, so yeah, it does exist for sure. Like again, I don't know that you're going to come out. And again, there's, there's so many landmines in, in writing about Jews anyway. But yeah, I think, look, there's, there's a show called Fleischman's in Trouble, which is every character is Jewish. They're all behaving very, very poorly. It was written by somebody in the neighborhood, in fact. Um, it's wonderful. But it's, um, so, yeah, so, but, but it's all the characters are Jewish. They go to Israel, they go, I mean, they're very, very secular and they're doing things that, that I would not do. Um, but they're very, very Jewish. So it's kind of, I think, I think some of the anti-Semitism has made has put the focus. Look, I believe that anti-Semitism happens when Jews are, you know, need to be reminded that we're that we're other. You know what I mean? Like it's a it's a it's a dangerous thing. I, I don't want to get too much into that, although that is my area of expertise is defining and explaining anti-Semitism. But we're not here to talk about that. Yes. So that's a, that's a great question. Um, I always knew what I did for a living. And again, it's not like, you know, that's why like, you don't see many people who are born like super religious, like, I say super religious, like going into this business because it's not such a kosher business. The, the biggest issues I had is, and now that I run my own room, the biggest issues I have is that there is a lot, there are a lot, a lot of, um, kind of like landmines and things to avoid that are very, very difficult. There's like Lashon Hara, how you speak, being uh, like I'll never, like for example, I'll never, I'm never alone in a room uh, with a woman. In my, I have a female assistant and a, there's always somebody else there. Um, Lashon Hara is a big deal, language, all these things that you do and you kind of have to build a wall. And I'm not saying that that's the best way to do that. I know that, you know, the, the ultimate level is not where I'm at. But I, I, I try not to, I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm getting paid for in the commerce. I mean, I'm not writing, God forbid, pornography, but I'm, writing, I'm not writing things that we're gonna show at the H banquet necessarily. So, but that's a level, that's something I'm working on. Yes? How was your experience for auditioning for SNL and have you had a chance to uh, audition in front of Lauren? No, I did. I sent it a tape. It was terrible. Next question. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. Where are the bottles? When I need it. No, I just sent, I sent it a tape, and stupidly, I left the, like, it was delivered to the investment bank where I was working at, and I got in trouble. Um, I'll take one more question. Yes. So how was your transition from finance? Like, how did you get into, so you said you did stand-up comedy, but yes. how did you transition into, like, film or TV? I knew there'd be a question about me transitioning. Um, <laughs> Comes up every time. I was born Jennifer. Uh, you know, again, it was it was. I was always a funny guy. It's like I said. It's like you you happen to see one of two skills I have tonight on display. 
Um, so I really do think it's just what you know. Again, like this Rabbi Orlowek said, like you, like God, God gave me um, a certain talents, and He really removed others. And um, this is my this is my talent. Is like I'm a good storyteller. Thank God. I've learned a lot. I don't think you could learn to be funny. I really don't think you could learn to be funny. I think you'd learn to be a better writer and, and write better structure. And like now, I'm in editing and post, and I'm able to like have a, a macro view and to go back and say, you know what, we shot this other thing, put that there, do this, put the line there, and like, and that's also 30 years. You know, the the one thing I'll say is a lot of most of you guys, all of you guys, are, are younger than I am, but you know, a lot of questions I get. Um, are um, how do I do what you do? And you weren't even born when I started doing what I do. Um, but I will say this about your generation, and be that like if you have ambition, you've got a clear runway um, in front of you because it's 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 uh, there's a lot of people, young people here who don't who just feel like what they need and they they feel like what they need and and it's so interesting. I heard like. The Torah never talks about your rights, it talks about obligations, and that's really what God wants, is that he wants, he wants a connection, and he wants you, you have obligations. As a Jew, as a human being, you have obligations, and you live up to those obligations, and I will guarantee you 100% the one thing I can guarantee you will lead a more fulfilling life. I'll leave on that. Drop the bottle. All right.